In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech. His wife's name was Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem, Judah, and they went to Moab and lived there. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other Ruth. After they had lived there about ten years, both Malon and Kilian died, and Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. When Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to aid to the aid of his people by providing food for them, she and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness, as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them goodbye, and they wept aloud, and said to her, We will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, Return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons who would become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters. It is more bitter for me than for you, because the Lord's hand has turned against me. At this they wept aloud again. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. may be seated. Great job, Alexis. A lot of tough names in there. You did awesome. So let me pray for us as we come to God's word. Let's pray together. Father, we pause and quiet our hearts now as we now come to your word that you have told us He is living and active, sharper than a double-edged sword. And Lord, that with it, you pierce us all the way to the bottom of who we are, like a surgeon's scalpel. You do heart surgery on us through your word. We, We pray, Lord, that you would come and do that this morning by the power of your spirit. Lord, come and use your word, your powerful word, upon our hearts today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So, kids, I got a question for us as we're getting started here. Uh, Has there been an experience lately where you were disappointed? Where things didn't turn out the way that you had hoped? Maybe things weren't working out for you. You have an experience like that lately? Yeah, I see one hand. Yeah, a couple couple more. It's It's kind of life, right? Where we just take those hits. I mean, every day tends to bring those hits where things don't really pan out the way that we hope. You know, I feel like in this reality, this this pandemic that we're living in now that just seems to just keep on and keep on going. There's so many times where you experience that. It's like doubly, you know, normal life has this, but I feel like so often there's just these incredible disappointments that happen in COVID just this past week. Our football team, like, they, they got their, their game canceled. I see Zeke back there. I'm, I mean, I'm just thinking about for what was it like for them, you know, to, for these kids to put all this work in and the high school football team, one kid on the team tests positive for COVID. They do contract tracing. Guess what? Half your team's in quarantine. They don't get to play a football game. Now, for some of us, that might seem like, oh, there's bigger things to worry about. No, but that's it. That's life, right? Where these, these things don't work out. You, you don't get to play in a game. Maybe you don't perform the way that you want to. Maybe you show up and you flunk the test. Maybe one of your friends betrays you. Maybe you're hurt by something that your spouse says. I mean, this is life. Things happen in this way. And here's the reality. When we're hurt, when we're disappointed, it's so hard to love. It's hard to love In the hard places. Just this past week. uh, Last weekend. 
Ashley was out of town with the majority of our kids. I had uh, Wynn and Gray home with me. They had a football game, so they stayed home. And so my house was pretty quiet. I mean, going from, you know, five kids down to two felt really liberating and freeing. And they're pretty independent at this point. And man, it was so nice. Like, I I was just kind of unbothered a lot. Well, a decent amount. Uh, and, And life was good, you know. Not a lot of problems, not a lot of things to tend to. But then on Monday... Ashley was coming home with all the kids, and they were coming home with a stomach bug. Now, hey, I mean, I just saw parents here go, oh, right? We all hate stomach bug, but when you got a, a big family, you know this is not just 24 hours of, you know, huggling, hugging the porcelain throne there. This is actually going to run through our family, picking off one by one for a week, right? So you just feel like the Grim Reaper is coming for you. And that's what this week felt like a lot for me. So they get home. Ashley somehow makes it home. And she was sick the whole drive home, driving these kids back. She gets home. She's straight to bed. I'm sitting there holding May. And my peace and quiet was gone. I mean, you know, a distant memory. And I'm sitting there. You know, kids are coming down off the high of kind of vacations. So they're grumpy. And I'm holding May and she's not feeling good. And I'm sitting there on the couch. She just wanted to be held. And all of a sudden, she just pukes all over me. And you know, the parents here are like, well, of course. That's, you knew that was coming in the story. And I'm sitting there. I'm cleaning up throw up. Actually, Ashley actually got up to help. But in that moment, I was just thinking to myself, man, woe is me. Right? What just happened? I went from like easy street to this. Where are you, God? You know, and and we laugh about it, but I'm telling you in my heart, that's what I'm feeling. I'm feeling alone. I'm feeling like, who's going to love me? You know, the last thing I want to do is take care of other people. So what do I do in that moment? I'm taking a hit. What am I doing in that moment? Well, I'm snapping at the kids. I'm not loving I'm not entering in. I'm not parenting. I'm snapping. And, and what do I, I mean, just my natural bent, you know, whenever I'm in that place of just struggling and what do I want to do, I want to run to my phone. For me, that's just like medication. You know, let me go get on my phone and surf. It's like a little, like, let me just get away for a minute. You know, I'm still in the midst of this. Let me just vanish and escape for just a minute. The point here is that whenever we come into this place and things get hard, it's hard to love. And we feel so alone. And instead of taking that to God, taking that pain to God, I tend to in that moment just feel like, God, where are you? I tend to interpret God through my circumstances rather than the other way around. And in those places, it's hard to love. We're starting a new series in the book of Ruth, which is all about love. I mean, it's all about understanding our vocation, if you're a follower of Jesus, your calling is to love. It's to be a people of self-denying, self-giving love. That's the calling of our life. In the book of Ruth, we see this amazing picture of how God uses the ordinary, self-giving love of ordinary people to bring about His redemptive purposes that literally changes the whole world. Through what happens here, David comes and eventually the Messiah Jesus. It's an amazing picture of this calling of love. But the thing for us to remember and to be in touch with coming in is that when things get hard, it's hard to love. And it's hard to love when you don't feel it. Right? The question is, as we come today is, how do we love in the hard places? So let's look at our passage. We're jumping in. Ruth chapter 1, right off the bat, it's bringing us into the setting, okay? It's setting up this whole story that's going to follow. And right off the bat, what we're told is that this story is going to take place, verse 1, in the days when the judges ruled. So that alone gives us a little understanding of what life was like in Israel during this time. Okay, in the days of the judges, if you're familiar With the Old Testament at all, if you've read the book of Judges, you know this was an incredibly hard time for Israel. They were led by these kind of tribal leaders who were judges. 
They were almost always incredibly corrupt. The people were constantly apostatizing and turning from God. They were being conquered. It was just an, a horribly difficult time in Israel. But even, any, even on top of that, we learn in the very next statement, there was a famine in the land. And we've never lived through a famine. We do find ourselves in a pandemic. This kind of world-altering reality that seems to touch every part of, of our lives. But, but a famine, I, I just have to imagine, it's pretty bad. I mean, can you imagine... Living in the midst of a famine and literally not having food, that's almost inconceivable for us. You know, when you're out of food, you go to the grocery store. We, I, I complain when the pantry's empty, right? But just imagine, what would it be like to be hungry? To not know where that next meal is coming and to not know where you could go find it. And on top of that, to be knowing people who were dying from hunger. This was an incredibly hard time in Israel. And then... We are introduced to this family, a man named Elimelech. He has a wife. They have two sons. In the midst of this famine, they flee Judah and they go to the land of Moab. Now, this is another sense of how things are pretty dire. Moab was on the other side of the Jordan. The Moabites were the descendants of Lot, which was Abraham's nephew. And they didn't really get along and didn't really like each other. And so it was not a place that you'd really want to go if you were an Israelite. But things were so bad in this famine, they flee to Moab. So they're in a foreign country. They're trying to just kind of live and exist. And their two sons find wives, Moabite wives. Now these were, uh, of course, not Israelites. They were foreigners. They married these wives. And then tragedy begins to deepen for this family. Elimelech, verse 3, Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. We then learn that both of her sons dies. And then she is left, uh, second part of verse 4, uh, verse 5, I'm sorry, Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. So it's kind of an all-encompassing description of the tragedy that has visited this woman's life. In this day, to be a widow was to be one of the most vulnerable people in all of society. In this day, in the culture of the ancient Near East, women had very little social standing. They had no way to earn a living. They had no social protection in their life. They were vulnerable. They could be exploited or just altogether neglected. So Naomi is left without a husband to provide protection in her life without sons to provide a heritage, which was everything in this culture. I mean, how would you live on after you died? Well, through your line, through your sons. She's left with all of that. She has no hope for her future. She is facing a dire last years of her life. And she has these two daughters-in-law that are now themselves widows. We're left with an incredibly hard situation, incredibly hard dynamic. Let me just invite you to just maybe get in touch with that a little bit. Now, maybe you can't relate to exactly what Naomi's reality was like. But the reality is, is that many of us in life, we find ourselves in hard places. Maybe you're, you're in one of those places now. Maybe tragedy has hit in your life. Maybe you're facing a diagnosis in your life. Maybe uh, relationships have not worked out in your life. Maybe you're, you're struggling financially in your life. I, whatever it is, now this is the reality of life, but I'm inviting you to get in touch with that so that you know something of what Naomi must have been feeling. We learn in verse 6, a glimmer of hope when she heard in Moab... Uh, when she was in Moab, she hears the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them. Naomi and her daughters-in-law pre- prepared to turn, return home from there. So, they hear news. There's hope in Bethlehem. There's food. They go home. They're on their way home. And along the way, Naomi begins to get hit with this reality. Okay, my life is pretty much over. But these daughters-in-law of mine who are going with me, their life's going to be over too. 
there's no prospect for them in Israel. I mean, they will be foreigners. They will be widows. The hope of them finding a husband there and social standing and then children to provide a heritage, it's slim to none. And so Naomi, in an incredible act of love, chooses to try to talk her daughters-in-law out of coming back with her. It's an amazing picture of love. Now just look at what she says to them here in verse 8. Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back each of you to your mother's house. May the Lord show kindness to you as you have shown to your dead and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. So now, Naomi says here, she pronounces a blessing. She prays for them and she says, I want you to go back to Moab. Now this is going to cost Naomi the little bit of something that she has in her life. But out of love, she knows this is better for them. It's worse for me. It's better for them. And she prays for them and pronounces this blessing. She says, may the Lord show kindness for you. Now, what's interesting there is right off the bat, we're introduced to a word that becomes a central feature for the book of Ruth. And it's the Hebrew word chesed. All right, now try to say that. And you got to kind of get it from down in here. You know, it's almost like you're hocking something up. You say, chesed. You'll say it? Chesed. Right? So, chesed, now I'm not going to talk every time, okay? Because I'm going to say use the word a lot. But chesed is this huge, unique to Hebrew concept of love. Some, it's, it's translated in different ways, but some of the most common ways that the Old Testament translates it is loving kindness, steadfast love, unfailing love. It's a Hebrew word that combines love and loyalty. Chesed is the kind of love that is a one-way love. It's a love that loves another person regardless of what you get out of the deal. Chesed love is a committing yourself to another person. It's a binding yourself to another person. It's a giving yourself away to someone else regardless of what you get in return. It's not worried about fairness. It's a kind of love that doesn't have an escape hatch. In fact, it welds the escape, escape hatch shut. It's covenant love. It's a love that promises yourself to another person regardless of what you're going to get out of the deal. It is a unique biblical kind of love. And it is a unique love for God Himself. Naomi is showing chesed love to her daughters-in-law because she's saying Look, this is going to cost me. It's better for you. So I'm going to die in order that you might know life. She's got to die to herself. And the reality is that Hesed always involves a death. A death to self. A death to the ego. We see that beautiful picture of love in Naomi as she encourages them to go. Well, of course, they refuse. No, we're staying with you. We're committed to you. And now one of the things that she prays is, may God show you Hesed the way that you've showed me Hesed. You see, they have loved Naomi in this way. To the degree that they're willing to go with her back to Israel, knowing there is very few options for their future. But Naomi in verse 11 begins to get firm with them. She knows they're not going to go away so lightly. So she presses in and she says, look. Let me tell you the reality if you come back with me. There's no hope for you. You're not going to find a husband. My life is over. Yours doesn't have to be. Now it introduces us a little bit to where Naomi's heart is. But the amazing thing is that in the middle of her love and her pain, she loves. Verse 14, and they wept again. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye. Which makes sense to us. Okay, if you insist, I'll go back. And she goes back. But here is the amazing turning point in the story so far. But Ruth clung to her. We're going to begin to see something in Ruth. Something deep, a deep kind of hesed love in Ruth. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and to her gods. Go back with her. I insist. I demand. Save yourself. 
Now watch Ruth right here. Here is Hesed's love. Look at what she says. Don't urge me to leave you or turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if anything but death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging. What a picture of Hesed. Ruth says, I don't care. I don't care what it's going to cost me. Where you go, I'm going to go. Where you die, I'm going to die. You see, Ruth is choosing a dying kind of love. She's utterly dying to herself. She's giving up her own good for the good of another. She's giving up her rights. I mean, she would have been so well within um, herself to go back to Moab. But she says, I mean, she even takes a vow before the Lord. Did you hear that? May the Lord deal with me ever so severely if anything but death separates us. She makes a covenant with Naomi. She takes a vow. May God judge me if I ever turn back on my committed love to you. She's burning the ships. I don't care what the future holds. I'm going to love you. You see, that is a tremendous picture of Hesed love. One way love. Committed love. Loyal love. It's the kind of thing that is called for in marriage. The covenant love in marriage is this kind of one-way love, but not just in marriage, but in all of our relationships, we are called to hesed love that loves when it's unfair, that loves when you get nothing in return. Now the question is, how is Ruth able to do this? How, how can she just utterly give up her life, because that's what she's doing, for another person? That really has very little to offer her. And the answer is. Right here in her statement. Is that the God of Israel. The God of Hesed. Has become her God. And your God. Will be my God. You see she was a Moabite. And she would have been raised in a foreign land. With foreign gods. She would have been raised to worship the God Chemosh. Who is very different from the living God. But yet we see at this point. That Ruth has come to commit herself to the God of Israel, to the God of Hesed. She has come to put her hope in His character, in His loyal love, that He would never leave her. That she can love like this, she can give her life up, and God is going to get her. It's like Ruth saying, listen, He's got me. And because He's got me, because I know He's got me, I ain't got to got me. I can give up my life for you. The only way to do that, the only way to do that, if you know the Hesed love of God very personally in your own life. So we continue the story, then they go into Bethlehem. They arrive in Bethlehem. And everyone immediately begins to say, Wow, can this be a Naomi? You know, Bethlehem's not that big, about like Trenton. And so they've moved away for a while, and they come back, and everybody would have known it, and they're like, Ooh. Naomi, you know, ironically, her name, names are very important in Hebrew, her name means pleasant. She ain't pleasant anymore. Look at what she says in verse 20. Don't call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Mara, because the Lord Almighty has made my life very bitter. Mara in the Hebrew means bitter. Look at what she says. I went away full, but the Lord has brought, brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Lord Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. See the place in which she is? She's low. She's broken. But you see her mindset is she is just sunk in self-pity. She says, God has abandoned me. God has turned His back on me. God has not taken care of me. God has afflicted me. And she says back in verse 13, the Lord's hand has gone out against me. He has mistreated me. You see, she is in this place that we so often, I think, find ourselves, I certainly do, is that we interpret God through our circumstances rather than the other way around. Have you ever been in that place? 
where things just go wrong and they go south. Maybe it's just a day that goes wrong from the get-go. Or maybe it's some tragedy that hits home in your life and you just feel deep in your bones, God, where are you? You have abandoned me. The easiest thing in the world to interpret our circumstances, to interpret God through our circumstances rather than the other way around. So she's given up hope. She has no hope. And if you have no hope, you, you can't love. Now, here's the amazing thing about the book. This is kind of the mastery of Hebrew stories. This creates a tension in us, right? So you read this here and you see Naomi and you're like, wait a minute, does God do that? Because if I'm looking in at her circumstances, I'm like, where are you, God? I'm, I'm kind of concerned. Do you do this kind of thing to your people? Is she right? Have you abandoned her? You know, so it invites us in with our own experience to say, "Uh uh-huh, I get you, Naomi. What is God going to do? That's how the power of these stories work. Can Can I just spoiler alert for you here? You know where this thing ends up? So Naomi begins at bitter. She begins at emptiness. You know where the book ends? Fullness. Joy. Transformation. Like right here, it looks hopeless. Like it really looks hopeless for Naomi. I mean, there is no way out here. And yet, God through this book is going to change everything. But you know the beauty, the beauty of the book of Ruth? It doesn't explicitly describe God acting in everything that's going to happen. It's amazing. Why would it do that? It does it to invite you to see God at work providentially behind every single detail and choice in the lives of these people we're going to follow. What we're going to see in the book is through their ordinary choices of Hesed love. Their ordinary choices of, ah, this hurts, I'm afraid, I got nothing to win here, okay, I'm going to love. And we're going to watch how God will use that to bring about His redemptive purposes. Because Ruth is going to become the great-grandmother of King David. God's going to provide for His people through Ruth. Which means Naomi gets this prominent legacy in her life. And eventually King David will be the precursor to the Messiah Jesus. The son of David. See, it's a picture of how God works in the everyday details of our life to bring about His larger redemption. In our larger, in our small choices of love. It's a beautiful picture. So here, let's apply it. Let's bring it home into our life. Where are the hard places in your life? Where are the places in your life where you're finding it hard to love? Maybe where life is not working out like you hoped it would be. Maybe where you're struggling with something in your life that's just incredibly painful in your life. Maybe you're struggling with sin in your life. Where where in your life are you finding it hard to move out in love and instead self-protection? You know, here's the thing about love in our world. You know, our our world is in love with love. Talks about love all the time. Every every you know uh, every song, every movie. It's all about love. You know, we love love in our culture, but it's a particular version of love. You know what the world's version of love is? And sad to say, it's in my heart and it's in your heart too. Love is a feeling. Right? Isn't that how it works? It just happens. Right? When we say, I love that, or I love you, what we mean is, I have a feeling induced by you. Right? Now, love is not totally absent of feelings, but it is not a feeling. It is a choice. Love is not something you get, it's something you give. Love has death in it. It has substitution in it. At the essence of love is saying, I'm going to die to myself for your good. That's the greatest barrier to love. It's me. We really don't have a problem with love. We just have a problem with what we love. We love me. The most natural thing in the world. So the greatest barrier to love is the self. It's the ego. I am fully committed to my flourishing. 
Maybe you picked that up in my story at the very beginning of our sermon. I'm committed to me. But you see, I cannot love until I die to me. It has to happen. See, that is the essence of love. Love always has a cross in it. The ultimate picture of love is the cross. Where Jesus said, I love you, and I love you, and I'm going to demonstrate it by, by dying for you. And what did he get out of the deal? My sin. My shame. And what do I get? His life. That's how work, love works. And it's always got a cross in it. So the question is, how do we love like that? How do you love when you're hurting? How do you love when things aren't going well? How do you love when you're disappointed? How do you love when you're not being loved? Ultimate question. Here's the only way. You've got to know and experience in the deepest places of your heart the tested love of God for you. There's no other way. You see, that was Ruth. The way that she's able to do this, love so heroically, is she was convinced, he's got me. Unless you get convinced deep in your heart, he Hesed loves me. You see, Hesed is not tied to how I perform. It's committed to me. It's covenant love. God has bound himself to us. Can you imagine that? God has looked on you and he like knows everything. You know, we, we hide stuff. We love to hide our sin and kind of minimize and justify ourselves. Here, here's a thought for you. You can't hide anything from God. He sees it all, even more than you see. He sees it all and he says, I will never leave you. I choose you. I've died for you. You are mine. I've got you. You don't have to worry about your life. I'm working out every detail of your life, especially the hard stuff. Or you're flourishing. See, you can know that here and not know it here. But if you begin to know it here, if it becomes, begins to be a reality here, you know what you can do? You can lose. You can give up your life for the sake of another person. You can move towards another, even whenever you feel empty. Even when you're not being loved in return. And it's the only way that you can do this. See, God just... He says things to us like in Isaiah, he says, can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? We think about that and we'd be like, no, it's instinctual. You can imagine a mother not loving the child that she's holding. Then he says this, though she may forget, it may happen. There are instances where that crazy thing happens. But me, I'll never. I'll never forget you. And he says in Isaiah 43, 2, when you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned, for I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. See, that's what he says to us. Hesed, love. I'm bound to you by blood. I'm going to be loyal to you, and I'm never going to leave you and forsake you. See, when that gets real in our hearts, it frees us to love. And it's the only way to love in this way. And here's the thing. We have no idea what God will do through our ordinary choices of love in our life. We have no idea what kind of redemption he'll bring through ordinary acts of selfless love. Let's stop there just for a minute and discuss together what stirs in you as you think about Hesed love, as you think about Ruth's love, as you think about how hard it is to love, especially in hard places. Let's just hear from one another and talk about it. If we're quiet, I'm just going to assume everybody's really good at love in here but me. Because I like told you how I struggle to love, okay? Thank you, Sarah. So he said, um, 
to really be able to love other people when we feel empty or when they may not love us back is to deeply know the Hesed love of the Lord. That's right. But how, like, I know it, but how do I, like, experience that more because it feels like I can't love anyone because, I mean, I, I guess I'm maybe not experiencing it to the depths where I'm compelled outward, but how, how does that change? Yeah, it's a great question. I'm sure a lot of us are thinking that. And I think for a lot of us who are believers and united to Jesus, um, we know his love and we love. Like, because I know you and I see Hesed love in your life for other people. But what you're expressing is this awareness of how, how lacking it is in places. And I, I think that's true for a lot of us. And so the question is, how do I grow in that? Right? And I think the way that we grow in that Hesed love is by experiencing His Hesed love more and more. And to the question of, well, how do we experience God's Hesed love, maybe that's the question. You, you only experience and receive love in vulnerability. So, um, let me just put it this way. Have you ever tried to love somebody or care for somebody and they don't receive it? You know, and, and usually it's uh, because we kind of tend to go through life this way of like, you know, I, I can handle it, you know, I've got it together and, you know, the shields are up. And you, you try to love somebody, it just bounces off. Because for love to get through, somebody's got to get vulnerable. I mean, even to receive love is vulnerability. So oftentimes, even in our relationships, when we'll say, hey, we say something like, hey, I love you. You'll experience kind of a deflection. Because we know that to receive that, I've got to open my heart. I've got to be vulnerable. I've got to see I need love. So... I think vulnerability is a key piece of coming to the Lord and receiving His love. Now, where do we find vulnerability with love, with the Lord? Our sin and brokenness. You know, coming in repentance and confession to Him and receiving through the gospel His grace in that place. So repentance and faith is a key part of that. But it, it, I think it's just literally opening our It's hard to even describe. I mean, I, I'm trying to learn this myself, just opening our heart and allowing God to love us. Easy. I was listening to something this week that also reminded me that in terms of, you know, Christ got, you know, in, in the exchange, what did Christ get? And you were talking about, you know, all Christ got, you know, was our sin and shame and, and that kind of thing. And it, it, it was also pointed out that he did it to get us. Uh-huh, yeah. That there was nothing, you know, he, he was rich beyond all, splash, beyond all splendor, and, but yet he gave up everything yeah. uh, in order to receive us. Yeah. And so I think we experience that Hesed love when we understand that he gave up everything not to not to get anything other than us yeah. and right. that is the the unconditional love that we don't you know bring anything other than ourselves and I think as we relate to others we so often deal in a transactional type level where we're trying to get or receive something yeah but living in the way that you're talking about and you know we're so we're suspicious of each other but in reality loving means i'm not doing this to get anything other than you yeah. that is to say a relationship with you yeah you know and to have that community yeah to have community and communion with another person um but i think it's you know has love is the covenant love the covenant is you know it, it is those vows and promises that god made uh, you know, between the Father and the Son, and then to us, and the the depth of that, and thinking of our relationships in terms of having a, a connection to that, mm -hmm. um, I think is is right. I don't. It's not easy to see on the surface, 
I think of of Ruth, but I think it's there, and I think connecting with that is uh, very powerful. Yeah, thank you, John. I I think that's that's an amazing point that you make that Jesus gave up his life in order to have us. And I think what becomes transformational is whenever that gets personalized for us, like personalized for you. I'm just going to be willing to bet. I know that I can say this with pretty much certainty. Many of us in here, I won't say most, but maybe it is most, but I'll say many of us in here are not experiencing the personal, intimate love of Jesus for you. Like we believe, yeah, I believe, you know, He loves me. Uh, he loves me this I know because the Bible tells me so. You know, I believe He loves me. I believe it at a rational level. I believe that this is true. But I, I just wonder for you, do you, do you really know and experience like His utter treasuring of you? And that might just be a totally foreign concept to some of us because we know our hearts. We say, well, how could he? That's how I often. I have to overwhelm my natural instinct to say, I, there's no way you could just love me. I have to overwhelm that with the truth of Scripture. Where his, where his love is just so explicit, I can't talk myself out of it. It's how you preach the gospel to yourself. And so, I would encourage you to do that. Could you take some time today or this week to get alone with God and just to meditate and see if I can just get in touch with his personal, intimate love of me? And if you do, I'm telling you, you will begin to experience love flowing for other people. I mean, I experience it on the spot. I naturally, I'm very selfish. But when his love breaks through, gets through the shields, hits my heart, it produces a desire to move towards somebody else, which is kind of counter to who I am. Yeah, I don't know if this totally applies, but I felt convicted as you were talking about this. Um, yesterday, Mark and I had a fight, which rarely happens. Um, of course. And I remember in the, in the middle of it, um, well, not in the middle of it, but at one point I just said, like, why does it always have to be about you? And I remember, like, as I said that, I was like, oh, that was bad. That was not good. But I think as you're sharing this in my heart, I think this runs like every time we, we fight. In my mind, I feel so, like I'm the one who needs to be loved right now. Yeah. And so it feels like to me, I'm like, man, I wish like we could just take turns being the one that needs to be loved, yes. you know? Yes. And then that would be much easier. Like, I can do that. You know, like, <laughs> right. I can do that. I totally love you. Because I know point. my turn's coming. Exactly. So, yeah. Right. right. And I think that one is really hard because I'm demanding this love yeah. from Mark um, and assuming he doesn't need it. Like, this is yeah. all just about me yeah. and it doesn't need to ever be about you. Yeah. But I also think it's even more beneath that a fear that, um, like, God doesn't actually, God isn't going to be able to fulfill it for me. So I need to make sure that at least Mark gets some of it. You know, like, at least I get some of this from Mark. Um, because I'm pretty sure, or at least, hmm, I'm at least not thinking about whether God is giving it to me. Yeah. Um, and so it feels really insecure and it feels like a fight and it feels, um, yeah, like I have to demand it. And yeah, yeah you see that in yourself and you're like, oh, that's horrible, you know? Yeah. But I think have, being able to say like, that's bad, but here's what I need, which is the Hesed love of God so that I can actually love Mark yes. and it not all be about me. Yeah. Um, I think that's really freeing instead of just seeing myself as like, oh, you're really bad at this, you yeah. know? Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that, Sarah, because I think it kind of brings us into like, this is like applicable to everyday reality. Like, the Bible actually can be applied to our lives, like to our marriages. I mean, you'll probably have an opportunity to, to apply this today, right? Where you're going to have a choice to say, Am I going to love my spouse or am I going to demand they love me? This is going to be, kids, you're going to have an opportunity to apply this with your siblings today. You're going to be able to apply this when you go to work tomorrow. You're going to be able to apply this at school tomorrow. I mean, this is life. The ultimate question is, am I going to love or am I going to demand love and love myself? 
And when you start to realize how hard it is to love, you're going to begin to say, how do I do this, God? Let it drive you to his hesed love for us, which is our ultimate hope. This is Ruth. She loves this way because she believes, God, you've got me. You love me. Okay, so I can love. Well, let me close this in prayer. Father, man, how much in our world today does this world need us to be a people of love? You called us to be that because you, you, you actually say you are love. What an enormous statement. Let us be a people that do hesed love in all of our relationships and all the places you take us in the world because we are experiencing day by day your hesed love for us. Come and do this for your glory. In Christ's name we pray.